Every week, on the bottom of the back of your bulletin is a question. And uh, I'm going to read that question to you today. It goes along with, with our sermon. We're going to continue as we've been going through verse by verse, line by line in the book of Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 27 today. And um, really we see to me a theme of, of decision making that's very common in our world today. It's full of deceit. It's full of wrong motive, um, of all kinds of things that we really wouldn't want to see in decision making, but we see that in the Word of God, in a godly family, in a family that God has chosen to use to bless all nations to come. And it, it's kind of sad that we see these type decisions come so early in Scripture from a godly family. But at the same time, it kind of gives us hope when uh, we're really honest about some of the things that take place in our own families. That God is a God of mercy, a God of love. The question is this. When making decisions in life, that's all kinds of decisions, not just big decisions, but every decision. When making decisions in life, do you tend to make decisions of what you think will work for you, or do you make decisions based somewhat in part of what God's Word tells you to do? The title of today's uh, a sermon is the motive behind our decisions. If you want to, uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis 27. And uh, as we start, I'm going to read a verse from two chapters earlier. You can go ahead to Genesis 27. Uh, the verse is this in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22, where Rebekah is pregnant. She has two children in her womb, and they are fighting one another. And she calls on to the Lord and says, what is going on? And his answer to her is listed here. Read along with or listen as I uh, repeat this verse. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. I want you to pay really close attention to that last part that God Almighty is talking to Rebecca about the children in her womb. And God says, hey, there's, there's going to be two nations, but unlike the normal customary way of things taking place, in this case, the younger uh, is going to receive the blessing and the older shall serve the younger. I want you to keep that in mind as we get into Scripture today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for each and every piece of this service today. This time where men and women have come together to just bring you honor and glory, to sing praises to your name, uh, to remember what Jesus has done through communion. And God, at this time that we just come and we open up your word, God, your word is truth. You tell us, thy word is truth. And God, we just ask at this time, knowing the promises that you give us, that none of your words go out and return void. Your words always have some effect. That God, as we go through this scripture today, that the Holy Spirit inside of each one of us would just stir that it would draw us closer to you, God, that you, through your Spirit, would meet us wherever we are on our journey in this life, in our journey of spiritual maturity. And God, would you just grab us? Would you encourage us, convict us if need be? But God, would you grow us stronger and stronger for you? We ask that there be power in your word today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, we've got a family that uh, the young and the restless took some cues from when we look in Scripture. 
And I want to talk about four people in this family. It is Isaac and Rebecca, the mom and dad, and their two children, twins, Jacob and Esau. Isaac is a man we know in Scripture that believes in God, but we find out through, through Scripture he doesn't mind lying. He lied just like his dad lied about who his wife was. We know that he has a favorite son. His favorite son is Esau. And as I said in our early service today, um, I could give a whole sermon series on favorites. Then we have Rebecca, the mother, who we know believes in God. And she loves her favorite son, Jacob. We have division in the family. We have Jacob, which is the younger, but only by a few seconds or minutes, because he's the second of a twin, who believes in God. He's partial to his mother. He's a cunning thinker and somewhat of a trickster, we're told as we go in Scripture. And then we have Esau. He's the eldest child, again, by just a few minutes, believes in God. Doesn't appear through Scripture to worry about too many things in planning. It's a live for the day. But we also see he gets angry kind of fast. What I want to bring to you here is everybody in our family today is totally different. You know, having raised, um, I, I say, three and a half children is my fourth. In raising children, I can tell you, you can give each one the same amount of love, guidance, discipline. And they respond to discipline in so many different ways. You've got to find the right one. But no matter what you do, each one is still going to be different. They're going to be different. They're going to have their own personality. You, you know what I'm talking about there. She's counting all those personalities right now. Um, you know, they're just going to be different, and we see this in this family. Let's go ahead and get into Scripture. Let's first look at Isaac. Genesis chapter 27, verse 1 through 4, if you would read along with me. And it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here I am. And he said, Behold, now I am old, I know not the, the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison." And make my savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Just a few things background looking here. We see Isaac, he can't see anymore. He knows he's getting older, and he has a feeling that he's about to die. You know, our feelings can deceive us, can't they? You know, he's somewhere, I think, around 130, 140 years old, 137 years old now. He's not going to die until he gets close to 180. But he has this feeling. Our feelings can lead us down the wrong road of interpretation. We need to be careful with that. And, you know, he knows that, um, that God has chosen Jacob to be the heir. But Isaac has always loved Esau. His time's getting short. And so he decides he's going to make this perfect moment. What in his mind would be the perfect event to control things and to do what he wants to do, which is bless the eldest son Esau, even though it's against what God has called him to do. You know, the way I think about this, I, I, I gave this analogy earlier. When I decided I was going to ask Melody to marry me, I had planned it all out. You know, as most of us, us men do, and women, forgive us. We got simple minds, all right? We can't think far outside the box. But I had decided exactly where I was going to propose to her. I had planned it out in my mind of exactly as it was going to be. And I took her engagement ring, and I put it on my gold chain, which I so proudly wore at that age around my neck. And I just had it sitting right there. And I said, I've got all of this planned event. It's going to be perfect. I won't tell you all the details, but it was going to be perfect. And she's going to see a, a glimmer come on that ring, and, and it's going to be the right time. Well, five days later, she still ain't seen that ring. <laughs> it just didn't happen the way I had planned it out. But I want you to see 
That's what I see uh, Isaac is doing here. He's got this wonderful event. He's thinking, I'll have my favorite meal. Esau, my favorite son, is going to do this. And I'm going to do what I think is right, we see in Scripture. Isaac wanted to bless Esau even though he knew God had chosen Jacob. He thought he was about to die. Our feelings mislead us. He wasn't about to die. And you know, as we go through this story, if we're not careful, just a little side note, we start to think how sad it is for Esau that he was taken advantage of, that his birthright was stolen by his brother, the youngest son. But remember, God said, Jacob will be heir. It was God who decided what or who would receive the spiritual blessing. Just a little character flaws with Esau. Remember, Esau gave away his birthright for a bowl of soup. Jacob didn't steal it from him. He gave it away. He also, if you remember in two chapters ago, he decided to marry outside of the godly family into family with not one wife, but two wives who believed in many other gods. So we find Esau is still Isaac's favorite. He still wanted to pass this blessing on to Esau despite having God, God making it clear that Jacob. You see, Isaac is making decisions from the flesh, not from the spirit. He's making worldly decisions with no thought whatsoever to what God has said or put into place. Let's look at Rebekah. Read along with me verses 5 through 10. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it into thy father, that he may eat, that he may bless thee before his death. So first of all, men, remember, the ladies will hear everything that is ever said in the house. <laughs> that was a joke, okay? <laughs> Didn't go over very well, but it was a joke. And it's a true one. <laughs> all right? Kids, moms do have eyes in the back of their head and four sets of ears. They hear everything. All right? So here is mother. Rebecca and Isaac are married from Genesis, we see that a married couple, two become one flesh. And they don't seem to be together on this. There's a big disagreement of which son should succeed. So we have Rebecca that hears what's taking place, and she's about to see that, that um, Isaac is taking things into his own hands. And what does she feel like she needs to do? Well, I need to counter this. I need to do what I think is right to make something happen the way I want it to happen. You know, it happens in today's times over and over. So what does she do? She, she goes to her son. Rebecca leads her son Jacob to deceive his father. Deception is always wrong. A lie is always a lie. God is not going to honor deceit in any way, no matter what motive you may have put in your mind that it is good. Rebecca, who loves Jacob as her favorite, decides to take things into her own hand. Essentially, she's saying this, because God has already said, I want this to take place. She says, instead of trusting God, trust me. Rebecca, the adult, well, they're both adults, the mother, tells her son to do something that is wrong and to trust her in doing it. Now, as a parent, we would never do anything like that, right? We would never teach our kids by telling them to do something that we know is not right simply because it is the easiest thing that we need done today. Let me give you an example. When your kid is sick, they're not supposed to go to school, right? And so you mask that fever with a bunch of Tylenol, and you sit your first grader down, and you tell them, 
I know you're sick, but don't you dare tell the teacher you had a fever. Because I, I can't carry you. I can't stay home. I can't do this. So you go, but don't tell your teacher you're sick. And when they go and get sick and the teacher says, what's going on? Have you had a fever? Yes, but my mommy told me not to tell you that I've had that fever. That is exactly what's going to take place. And we laugh about that and we joke around. But seriously, what are we teaching our kids? That it's okay to lie, to deceive under certain circumstances. We see it all the way back in Old Testament Scripture. Jacob here, we think he's the innocent one. He's a kid. He's doing what his mama says. He's 50 years old. There's no reason that he doesn't know right from wrong. Do we know for sure he knows this is wrong? She is asking him to dress up differently, to deceive his father. He knows it is wrong. Application number one. No one can be trusted when they're making decisions in the flesh. In other words, when there's, there's no bearing of what God's Word says, when the decisions are totally on just what I think is right, without having the Word of God in our decisions, no one can be trusted when they're making decisions in the flesh. Genesis 27, let's look at Jacob, verse 11 through 17. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am some smooth man. My father, preadventure, will fill me, and I shall see, uh, seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be the curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house and put them upon Jacob her youngest son and she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck and she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. You know when we look at Jacob here his only concern is this. Will it work or not? It's like that's going to find this out. His concern is will this work or not? There is a word that's a kind of common way of thinking today. It's called pragmatism. Pragmatism is a theory that we determine what is the right thing to do by what will succeed. We have to be careful in pragmatic thinking. We call it, some people like to call it common sense thinking. You only do what you know will work. But if we don't have God's moral standard in our pragmatic thinking, then we are completely wrong. Because we're relying on man's thinking as if man is the absolute truth in the way of doing things. And it actually will go against God's sovereign will. In pragmatism, if we look at that kind of thinking, the true theory of pragmatism as a test for truth, it's obviously false. Pragmatism can lead to false conclusions because we as humans have limited knowledge. Have you ever made decisions and then later when you found out more information, you said, that just wasn't the right thing to do. That's making decisions without God's influence. And pragmatism not only lacks moral power, it actually erodes it. If we make decisions just off of what we think is right with no question or no leading of God's Word and the Holy Spirit, we are relying on ourselves as determining truth. And it goes against God's Word. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. When we think only in the flesh, that's a part of leading of the Holy Spirit or God's Word. We make mistakes. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We want to live life, and not only live life, but make decisions in life in or led by the Spirit. When we think only in the flesh, we're going 
to make mistakes. Application number two, what works for us in our limited human knowledge is not what is necessarily true or what works from an eternal purpose or eternal perspective. I'll say again, what works for us in our limited human knowledge is not what is necessarily true or what works from an eternal perspective. Let's continue looking at Jacob, verse 18 through 27. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according uh, as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat my venison, that thy soul may bless me. We have deceit in action. Verse 20, And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord God brought it to me. Do you see what's taking place here? God will never use deceit to get His will done. And so if we're operating in deceit, we dare not say, God told me to do it, <laughs> or God has helped me to do this. That, that is taking the Lord's name in vain. Do we have that that happens to us today? Early in my ministry, I gave a partial piece of this story. I'll give the complete piece. Now, early in my ministry, I had a, a person that called uh, the first church I was pastoring, and they, they sent it to me. This person was in need, but it was unlike what normally would take place of a person in need. This person came in with a very strong personality, and uh, Bible in hand about this big, and came and sat right at the front row of the service, and had talked to me before the service, and, and I told them that I would talk with them uh, later on, but they sat there, and then after service, they wanted me to bring the deacons around, and here's what they said. God has told me that this church is going to give me $1,000 today. And I, as a young pastor, was like, man, our heart is supposed to be a heart of love. We're supposed to help but something just wasn't clicking for me. You know, it just didn't feel right. And this person just strongly over and over and over again said, God has told me you're going to give me $1,000. And, and I, I was talking to the deacons at the church, and, and uh, I called him the head deacon. Mr. They said, Carney, did God tell you that? And I said, well, no. He said, well, it don't sound like it's true to me then. <laughs> so that's what we told him. God may have told you, but he didn't tell me. <laughs> we have to be careful when people say, God told me to do this, can God speak to us today? Can He speak to us through His Word and guide us in a certain place? You better believe He can. Could He audibly speak or lead us today? Can the Holy Spirit lead us today? Yes. But we better not step out and say, God has asked us to do this unless we're sure He has. The ultimate deceit for Christians for believers is to say, oh, this is all God's plan, as if that's the total backing we need just to get our way. And that's where we see Jacob is. He says, oh, the only way I could have got this so fast is because God, God led him to me. We continue in Scripture. Read along with me. Um, verse 21. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be uh, my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice of Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, and his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, Another lie, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee, and that he brought it near to him, and did eat. And he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come now here. Come near here and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of ramet, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field which the Lord hath blessed. What was Isaac smelling? The clothes that Rebekah had taken from Esau's closet or out of his room and put on the sun, and domesticated goats instead of the venison that was out in the field, and he was all the happy for it. His feeling could make no difference in truth. We see a blessing takes place. Read along with me. Excuse me, application number three. When it comes to lying, 
Those that lie believe their lie is for the greater good. They honestly believe it's okay to lie, to deceive, because in their mind to make things right, it's for the greater good. Now let's look at the blessing, verses 27 through 29. Verse 28, excuse me. Therefore God give thee the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that is cursed thee and blessed be that bless thee. The blessing is passed from Isaac he thought to Esau, but through trickery, it went to Jacob. Now remember, this is the family blessing that is a covenant in itself that cannot be broken. It cannot be pulled back. It is given. It, is, it means that this is the next person that will lead this family and, and receives all the properties, all the leadership rights that go along with it. But the real blessing that took place here that had nothing to do with deceit, God had decided that the spiritual blessing would go to Jacob. We see, no matter what, application number four, no matter how much we meddle in trying to control or change God's plans, the sovereign will of God will be done. We see a father that did not like what God told him to do. And through growing his son for years, his favorite son Esau had planned this time as we start off at the beginning of this chapter, this perfect time that he would alter the plans of God. That he would pass this blessing knowing it could not be removed through deceit. But God still made sure his sovereign will was accomplished. Now, there's one family member we hadn't talked about yet, and that's Mr. Harry Redman Esau. Let's see his attitude to all this, starting at verse number 30. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, that Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, and Esau his brother came in from the honey. Can you imagine what he's thinking? Dad said, go out, do what I like to do. I went out and killed. I've cooked venison, and I'm bringing it back because today I'm going to receive my blessing. He's got to be a happy guy. I see him just skipping along as he comes in with the savory meat. Verse 31, and, and he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless thee. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that taketh venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. It is an understanding in this time that the blessing is a one-time thing. There's only one blessing that comes from a father. There's no way to take it back. Esau understands this. If Jacob is 50 years old, by the way, Esau is 50 years old. <laughs> These are not some young kids. These are grown men that know right and wrong. He knows the understanding of an oath or a blessing. But what is he saying? Daddy you got to give me something. Bless me. Verse 35. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, is, it, is he not rightly named Jacob? Which means trickster. For he hath supplanted me these two times. He hath taken away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? What I want you to see is although Esau was done wrong, Look at his mental attitude. I am the victim. He goes through his whole life saying, I am the victim. And that means he responds to everything in his life 
as I am the victim. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ died on the cross, so nobody in here is the victim. Amen? We have been overcome by Jesus Christ's death. And if you are living your life constantly, over and over, putting yourself at the place where people will have pity on you being the victim, get out of it. Because it's not the right place to be. Esau says Jacob stole his birthright. Jacob did not steal his birthright. He gave it to him for a bowl of soup. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem practical that that would even happen. But he didn't care about his decision at the time. He wanted chicken and dumplings instead. But what does he do in the blame game? He blames Esau. It was all, or he blames Jacob. It was all trickery. Jacob didn't trick him. He plainly gave it to him. Now here, there is trickery that's in place, but it's not only Jacob, it's mom too. And by the way, all they did was go against the lie and the trickery that you and your dad were already doing. Can you see the drama in this family? Doesn't it give us hope? Because I know the drama that's in all our families, that we're still going to be okay. <laughs> that even with this craziness, this mess going on, God still blesses. Where was I at? I'm sorry. Let me get back in Scripture. Uh, verse 37, verse 36, And he said, Is it not he rightly named Jacob? Verse 37, And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Give me one, bless me, even me, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice, and he wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, the dew of heaven from earth, and by the sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. Pay particular attention to the ending of verse 42. And these words of Esau, her eldest son, were told to Rebekah. Rebekah hears everything. And she sent and called Jacob her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself purposing to kill you. So Esau, playing the victim, has decided, I've got to put my attention, my focus, it's got to be somebody else's fault. Nowhere does he say, well, I haven't lived my life right or not done my decisions. It is all Jacob's fault. What does he say here? He plots to kill him. Not only does he plot to kill him, he comforts himself with the plot to kill him. Hopefully none of you are in here today plotting to kill anyone. But I will guarantee you, many of us have comforted ourselves in waiting on the day that misery would come to somebody else. Am I right or am I wrong? In an ungodly heart, in a heart that's not living by decisions of the Spirit. In pragmatic thinking, we can say, well, this person did me wrong, and so for me to correct it, it's only right that when I get the chance, I will do them wrong as well. I will correct what has taken place. And that nowhere goes along with Scripture. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And he will act vengeance where vengeance needs to be. You know, can you imagine what this is doing to the family now? Oh, the happy family of four. Husband is upset with wife. Wife is upset with husband. Sons can't talk to each other or they'll kill each other. This son doesn't like his mother. This son doesn't like his father. Just the misery that is taking place. We see... Hatred that is, is just growing in Esau. He's comforting himself. Oh, I feel so good just thinking about the bad thing that one day will come to Jacob. Is that what God has called us to do? 
read along a few more verses, verse 43 through 46. We see the results of all of the family decisions. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. Rebecca is talking to Jacob. You know what's going to happen here? She's saying, Jacob, leave until your brother comes down. Because of all of this, she will never see her son again. Jacob is gone. We go on in verse 44. And tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he, he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Then we see in verse 46, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Rebekah sends Jacob away. She'll never see him again. Isaac is crushed because what he wanted didn't happen. Esau is a man of rage for the rest of his life, living by the sword, um, finding comfort only in his plans to enact revenge on his brother. And Rebekah now fears for her own future if Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth. Application number five. Decisions that are made in the flesh are destructive. When we make our decisions a part of God's sovereign word, or the Holy Spirit's leading in our life, when we solely base them on what we want in trying to control the outcome, that is a decision in the flesh, and decisions made from the flesh are destructive. What do I mean by this? I'm going to turn us to the book of Galatians as we end today. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul is reminding the church of what Christ had done for them. Um, that he had removed them from the yoke of bondage. They were now free because of Christ dying on the cross, his righteousness being given to us as believers, not by what we did, but because of our faith. And um, when the Bible speaks of flesh, it's usually talking about our heart motives apart of God. And there's something in this scripture, if you would read along with me, starting in verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5. It says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty, that's freedom. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, that's without God in your thinking. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, it kind of mimics something Jesus said in the book of Matthew when someone was trying to trick him and asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied that you love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, and the second is like that you love your neighbor as yourself. It's talking about the works, the fruit in which we do. Love one another. Love God and love others. Application number six says this. Any work that is done apart from faith or love for God or any deed not empowered by the Holy Spirit is a work of the flesh. Even if it might be something good, if our motive is not to bring praise and honor to God or be led by His Word or by the Spirit, then it's for some other benefit. It's not of God. It is of the flesh. Paul speaks to the, book, uh, to the church of Galatia in the book of Galatians. And he says, start with a heart motive that you will love God with everything, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second piece of making your decisions is with love for everyone else. Love for your neighbor. Galatians, if you'll go a little bit further with me, in verse 22, there is a verse. 
It talks about living in the Spirit. It's saying the fruit of living in the Spirit. And it's a singular. It's all of these things as if they're one, not many fruits. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, Against such there is no law. That's how we should be living. Our decisions should be made in life, in every aspect of life, of loving God with everything, loving our neighbor as ourself, which produces these things. He goes on in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. In other words, we no longer will make decisions a part of God's will, a part of God's Word. We've put to death our own fleshly decisions. Then he says something in verse 25. If we live in the Spirit for the believer, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, We've been given something new. It's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We get it automatically through faith in Jesus Christ. And so he's saying here, if you live in the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, if you're a born-again believer, he says, let us also walk in the Spirit. What I want you to see is Paul must have clearly known and is making known for us. Just because you have the Spirit inside of you does not mean you will walk according to that Spirit. He's saying you've got everything you need inside of you as a born-again believer. So make decisions walking in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Verse 26 says this, Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another or envying one another. It's another application I added. Decisions that are made from the Spirit will never promote personal vainglory. Decisions made from the Spirit will not provoke another that is walking in the Spirit. Decisions made from the Spirit will not promote envying one another. Decisions made in the Spirit will only promote God Almighty. Let me ask you this. In your church circles, in your church friends, do you ever have conversations that bring up bitterness and envy? towards someone else in your church family. I assure you of this. That did not come from God. What we decide to do in life, how we make decisions of doing this or doing that, small decisions, large decisions, con decisions and conversations, all comes down to the motive behind the decision. I just ask you this, in every decision in life, you make hundreds of them in a day. Are you thinking, God, what do you want me to do with this? God, what does your word say? Is my moral um, uh, defined totally out of scripture? Or is it just what I think is right in my own eyes? What's your motive? Are you trying to please yourself and accomplish what you want to get done? Or are you trying to bring glory to the Father? Bringing glory to the Father is not just Sunday morning when we have a great worship service. Bringing glory to the Father is how we live every day of our life. Look at this family from Genesis 27. They were messed up. But man, there's hope for all of us, isn't it? Because if we look around, we are all messed up somewhere. We have that in our family close to us. It may be us ourselves. You know, the wonderful thing about God is that we can make a decision today 
Maybe we're saved. Maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. I know the majority here have, but there may be one or some today that never have done that, that have never stepped out in faith to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to understand from this simple belief of me putting my faith that my eternal security has been done. It's been accomplished. No man can pull me from my Father's hands by me putting my faith in Jesus Christ. That's an automatic trait of His Holy Spirit living inside of us, but it does not guarantee we walk by the Spirit. Where are you at walking with the Spirit? I know I have to remind myself daily to die, die to self so that I can live for Christ, and I fail miserably many days. But is it your heart intent to walk in the Spirit? Or is it okay just to praise Him on Sunday and walk the way you want to the rest of the week? What is the motive behind every decision you make in your life? Your motive should be, I want to bring honor and glory to the Father through Jesus Christ. As Kathy comes up and plays our hymn of decision, whatever comes up, I ask you to stand. We're going to sing the first and last stanza. As you sing, I just ask you, as God touched you in some way from the message that has been uh, delivered today. And if that is the case, would you respond to that? Uh, maybe it is through conviction and you just want to come and you want to get right with the Lord. Make that happen today. Maybe you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today can be that day. Maybe you just want to praise Him for His goodness. In every way, let today be that day, but do not quench the Holy Spirit. The altar is not off limits. It's a good place to be. Let us praise the Lord as we sing together.